I've heard you speak of enlightened masters, and you spoke of Roshi as being a master's master when you met him. And I've heard you tell stories of other teachers that you lived with in your encounters. I've never heard you, when you've talked about your influences, of what's influenced your teaching, I've heard you talk about an Uba Kin lineage or a Mahasi Sayadaw lineage in terms of what they brought and noting or body sensation. Or, but the only teacher I've heard you really speak of and you shift totally when you talk about him is Roshi. Meaning Sasaki Roshi. Sasaki. Roshi is a general title in Japanese for any mass. Any uh, Zen master is called a Roshi. But yes, Joshu Sasaki Roshi. Yes. Um, and if there are other enlightened masters that might come into this conversation, we'll weave that too. But my interest here would be to have you talk about what it's like to be in his presence and work with him and what having this man's... Um, I don't know, energy input into your life, what that is for you as a teacher, because I don't know who else you go to for your support. When I came back to the United States, um, I realized I still needed a teacher, but I didn't have anybody that I could go to within the tradition that I wanted to work in, which is the mindfulness tradition. After I'd been back here for a few years, I, I was drawn to mindfulness because uh, it could be extracted from the cultural milieu and, he, and the religious matrix uh, of Buddhism and presented as a fully secular practice. And so that appealed to me and I liked the systematic nature of mindfulness. But by the time that had happened, that um, I I was probably the senior mindfulness teacher in my part of the world, okay? But I needed somebody vastly senior to myself to kick my ass. Um, and the only place I could find it was in the Zen tradition, which is not the tradition I really wanted to work in, although I am, was familiar with it because I had lived in Japan and so forth. So, um, and Sasaki Roshi was certainly the senior Zen master in the United States at that time. And he's now argu arguably the senior living Buddhist master in the world at 102, as having started his practice, monastic practice, at the age of 13. Do the math. How long has this guy been practicing? I had to study with someone, so it wasn't really in the tradition I was drawn to. Do all teachers think I need someone to kick me in the ass to do, I mean, most No, some wouldn't. people, mo a lot do, but some people go off on a, that's one of the ways that teachers, uh, that the wheels sort of come off, if a teacher doesn't put themselves under some other teacher. They get a certain degree of experience and then they're sort of off, but then the, now they don't have feedback loops and their students won't give them feedback because they're in awe of them and problems can develop. Right. So I wanted to make sure I'd seen... It's very healthy of you to have said, I need somebody to... I think it's a, just a, a safety, it's like a safety net, you know. Even though at that time I had practiced for a long time, I still wanted someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, I've gotten three things from him. One is I learned not to suppress my sense of self. In my initial years of practice. I thought, oh, the Buddha says enlightenment is no self. If I have any sense of self, then I'm, then I'm not making progress. And suddenly I was suppressing self-referential body sensations, mental images, and internal talk. The stuff that's self-referential, uh, that gives you the sense of self moment by moment. I was suppressing that. I was trying to get rid of that. And Sasaki Roshi is a very balanced teacher. So he teaches that, yes, there's no self, and then there's full self, and those are both no self experiences. Okay, there's self as nothing whatsoever. The, as T.S. Eliot said, the still point between two waves of the sea. And then there is the wave, which is the 
personality arising not as a thing, but as a doing. And I'd been suppressing the doing of self. Mm -hmm. And so he disabused me of that imbalance in my practice. That was the first thing. By he his got example from or did he say? No, by his direct teachings. Okay. By all he constantly emphasized that we're always cycling between experiences of, of zero self and the re-arising of the feeling thinking self. And then it goes back to zero and this is a natural yeah. process. Everybody participates in it. Enlightened people realize they're participating in it. And really enlightened people um, participate in it wholeheartedly without preference one side versus the other. So I got, he disabused me of my notion of preferring uh, no self to fullness of, to unfixate itself. Okay. Then he gave me the paradigm of impermanence in terms of expansion and contraction, which represents a vast generalization of the early Buddhist concept of anicca or impermanence. Um, and it's a far more flexible and encompassing model uh, and puts a whole positive spin on what in early Buddhism was sort of looked at as part of suffering uh, and had a negative spin. So I got that expansion contraction paradigm, which very nicely maps onto mathematics and physics. And it's just a very, very useful way of guiding people into the experience of impermanence. I got that from him. The other thing I got from him was sort of the direct vibe of when, because when you're with him, he's space expanding and contracting, and that tends to reach out and sort of pull you into his world. And then, but then you have to go back to the meditation hall and you have to internalize that zap of energy. See, some people, they get shaktipat, they get a zap of energy from a teacher, but then what do they do immediately after that? Well, they sing bhajans to the teacher and they talk about how great the teacher is and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it becomes a whole devotional thing. And then they're just a leaky capacitor that loses that shakti and then they need another recharging, okay? Yeah. What I like about Zen is, they never talk about it, but when you go in for the Zen interview, you get a zap of the flow of, of, of nothingness from that teacher. But then what do you do? Do you sit around and then s sing the praises of that teacher and get into a whole cult? No, they send you back to the meditation hall where it's cold in the winter or there's bugs biting you in the, in the summer. Uh, you're sleepy, you're getting beat up, you're getting yelled at, all of this shit is happening. Now, can you apply that flow that you got from the teacher to this situation? Meaning, can you internalize it and truly make it yours so you become like that teacher, not a devotee of that teacher? That's the difference between the Guru Zap in one tradition and in the Zen tradition. And that's, I got that from him within that context. So those three things, disabusing me of my subtle tendency to suppress the self, giving me this incredibly powerful paradigm that maps nicely onto science uh, with regards to impermanence as the fundamental insight, and then a, a sort of direct transfer of that flow of impermanence from him, but within the context of making me strong and independent of him because I would immediately have to go and actually apply and internalize it uh, and make it my own.